And Chair Newman, you saw that Kingston is our is here tonight. King Kingston is here tonight. Sorry, Kingston is here. Did you hear that? You're talking to me. I can barely hear you. No, uh, I was talking to uh, Chair Newman that Kingston is here tonight from the okay. community TV. Okay, great. No additions or deletions. Hearing, hearing nothing. Uh, we'll go to public comments. Maybe we should give the public a few more minutes, a few more seconds to respond. While we're waiting, we'll come back to public comment in case anybody is a little bit late. Uh, commission comments. Any other commissioners have any comments? I have a question. Okay, I apologize. I'm just I'm wondering what the status is of the uh, Monterey Avenue palm tree application for removal. At this point, I believe they're still working on their um, the arborist report. Uh, Planner Sasanto, do you have any newer updates? Okay, uh, I do not. Um, and I haven't spoken to them recently regarding this project. However, I have heard from um, individuals with their, their current dealings with pg and &E that a lot of projects are taking um, a lower priority given other county events. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is among them. Yeah, so at this point, we, we have an incomplete application any, before we can bring it. Any other commissioners have any comments? No I have a couple uh, of enforcement issues I wanted to uh, raise or get updates on. One is the um, uh, mattress company on the corner of Claire's and 41st. They again had a whole bevy of signs up on uh, um, Labor Day holiday. Has anything further been done with them or are they just going to continue to do this forever? 
I'll let Planner Sasanto respond. He's been managing that. Yeah, uh, I believe it was the the day following Labor Day that they were um, seemed to have signs on and were cited for that, and it was discussed with their on-site staff. I haven't seen it on other occasions going out to the site, but that is still open. Okay, and the other one I had, I think it's new, is the taqueria that's next to the building's deck. With the prior owner, we had an issue of blocking the public uh, walkway there that goes around the building with their tables. And uh, prior to the COVID shutdown, we, I don't recall any problem with them, but now that they uh, reopened to serve customers, they're blocking that uh, walkway. And I don't think they know maybe that they're not supposed to. So I'll just uh, pass that on. Okay, any staff comments? Um, I, I did want to announce that the the Coastal Commission um, certified our LCP amendment um, for the sign ordinance as well as the uh, secondary dwelling unit ordinance. So at this time, the new standards do apply citywide. Okay, You're welcome. okay. then next item is approval of the minutes. We're now uh, up to May 7th, uh, 2020. And uh, it's a little hard to remember the meeting four months ago, but does anyone have any uh, corrections or additions to the May 7th minutes? If not, can we have a motion to approve? I'll move approval of the minutes. Do we have a second? Okay, roll call vote. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Uh, Commissioner, who did I forget? Uh, Ruth? Aye. And the uh, chairman also for that. It passes. It takes us to the consent calendar, but before we do that, I'd like to ask uh, if we have had any um, public members express any interest in uh, public comment? Apparently not. One, one moment. No, we have not. Okay, thank you. So the consent calendar has two items on it. One is 606 Escalona Drive, which is a design permit for a second story addition to a non conforming two story single family residence located within the R1 zoning district. The other one is 521 Riverview Drive, which is a design permit for a second story addition to a two story single family residence located within the R1 zoning district. Sounds almost the same. Uh, do any of the commissioners uh, desire to remove either of those items? I do not, uh, but I do have a question. It's been so long since we've uh, had a meet event situation. I forget on the consent calendar, uh, due to proximity, I live too close to six and six that's going So I don't know if we want to break them out. But it seems like on the consent calendar, we don't have to achieve those. Okay, well, thank you for that. We'll, when we both look, we'll do it in two separate votes so you can uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I, I have to ask that I have to recuse myself from item A. Okay. Or we still have a quorum on, our, on both items. So let's give the public an opportunity to uh, remove either of these items for public hearing. We'll take uh, uh, a minute or so and see if anybody in the public wishes to have either of these items heard. Uh, at the public hearing.
take it. Uh, so far, nobody has uh, uh, requested a hearing. Is that correct? So I'll assume it that, is. That that is we'll correct. Yeah. Am I being heard? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. We'll move on to the um, the, pub, the two public hearings, and if anyone uh, belatedly requests that either the consent, well, we need to move the consent items, but if anybody belatedly requests a hearing on either of them, we'll go back and uh, undo that action. So do we have a motion on the consent items? So moved. And do we have a second? Question. Are we are we step, are we asking uh, to vote on them separately? Are we doing four A separately than four B? Oh, good point. Yeah, I forgot about that already. So, so I, I move approval of consent calendar item four A. Okay. Second. All right. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Christensen. I refuse. Refuse. Commissioner Welch. Refuse also. Commissioner Ruth. Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Chairman, aye. So do we have a motion that passes? Do we have a motion for item B? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. And, and Chairman, aye. So that is... <laughs> Passed. That takes us to public hearings. And the first public hearing, uh, the property is at 1860 43rd Avenue. This is an application for a variance for a first story patio encroachment into the required side yard setback for a two story single family residence located within the R1 single family residential zoning district. We have received some written comments on that. And staff report, please. Thank you, Chair Newman, members of the Public Commission. Uh, as you mentioned, the applicant tonight is requesting a variance for a first story patio encroachment into a required side yard setback. Next slide, please. The existing residence at 1860 43rd Avenue is a two story single family residence. Uh, surrounded by one and two story single family homes, as shown here. Next slide, please. In August 2019, the applicant applied for a building permit for an interior remodel, foundation improvements, and new windows. The site plan included a four foot by 20 foot one inch uh, wood frame landing in the south yard side setback, shown here in blue. After one revision, the plans were approved by the planning staff in October of 2019. In January of 2020, the applicant submitted an addendum for door and window changes that included the same four foot by 20 foot one inch wood frame land in the south side yard setback. That addendum was approved by planning staff on January 16, 2020. Next slide, please. On April 17, 2020, the applicant submitted a second addendum for interior improvements related to building plan check comments from the city's third party planning check consultant, CSG consultant. The second addendum plan set included an 11 foot 3 inch by 29 foot 8 inch raised concrete patio on the floor plan on sheet A2. The new patio was not shown on the site plan on sheet, on sheet A1. The building department typically sends all exterior modifications to the planning department for review, but in this instance, the building department inadvertently neglected to send the plans to the planning department for review, and the building department granted the permit. Next slide, please. On July 15th, the planning staff conducted a final inspection for the project. On the site, the staff noted that the patio was located seven inches from the side lot line, well within the required three foot side yard setback for decks less than 30 inches in height, as shown here. Next slide, please. The patio, as built, is 10 feet 6 inches wide by 30 feet deep, with several pop outs at 11 feet 2 inches in width. The pop outs also have large PVC pipes extending through them for irrigation lines for future planters on the patio. Staff informed the owner that there are two options which are remove the area of the patio within the three foot side yard setback or apply for variance. On August 31st, 2020, the applicant submitted a variance application to keep the patio in the side yard setback. The application includes 
a letter from the applicant and a letter from – of support from the neighbors of the adjacent property to South who would potentially be impacted by the nonconforming patio. The application also includes a quote from a contractor stating that bringing the patio into compliance by moving the three feet closest to the fence would cost $10,000. Next slide, please. Pursuant to Capital and Municipal Code Section 1715.120G, the X and the R1 zoning districts that are less than 30 inches in height must maintain a three-foot side yard setback. The patio, as built, as I mentioned, does not comply with this development standard. In order to keep the patio in the current location, the owner must obtain a variance from the planning commission. Next slide, please. To approve a variance, the planning commission must make two findings. That there are special circumstances applicable to the property that deprive the property of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity than the same zoning classification, and that the grant of variance would not constitute the grant of special privilege. In relation to the variance finding A, the special circumstance applicable to the subject property is that at 60 feet wide, it is wider than the standard lot width of 40 feet for the majority of the lots on the street. Next slide, please. In relation to variance finding B, the majority of the lots on 43rd Avenue have non-conforming residential structures that do not comply with the size setback requirements, shown here with yellow stars. Therefore, the granting of variance of the size setback requirement would not constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent with the limitations on other properties in the vicinity. Next slide, please. The applicant is proposing to mitigate the privacy issues caused by the proximity of the patio to the adjacent neighbor by installing a six-foot tall fence with two feet of line up at the top. This mitigation measure complies with the fence height regulation. Staff suggested that the applicant place planters along the portion of the patio closest to the neighbor to act as a three-foot buffer, shown here in blue. But the applicant did not put the suggested planters in the plan. If the planning commission chooses to approve the variance, the commission may add a condition requiring planters is considered an appropriate mitigation tool. Next slide, please. So that staff recommends the planning commission approve the project based on the condition of approval of variance findings. Do we have any questions for the staff? I wanted to... Is the fence already there? There is a fence, but it's only five feet five inch high, five feet five inches high with no lattice on top. So there is a new fence that extends the full six feet plus two feet of lattice. Okay, so they're going to replace that fence? Yes. Excuse me, Chair Newman. This is a public hearing, and we do have written comments from the applicant and from the neighbor, and we should take a minute to see if anyone wants to provide any additional comments by phone or by email. So we'll wait one minute. And it looks like we have a hand raised under the participants. You see a hand raised? I do. I'm going to... Debbie Hale, I'm going to allow to talk at this time. Debbie, are you there? Hi, we're here. So my name is Debbie Hale, and I'm here with my husband, Andy Ward. Hi. And we're the neighbors immediately to the south of the property, and we just wanted to let you know that this is the side of our property that largely faces the wall. There's only one window that faces in the direction of the patio, and we can't even see over the fence because of our setback. And so we have no concerns with the patio being in the location that it's at in terms of interfering with our enjoyment of the property. And it wouldn't really make any difference to us if they put the planters there or not because we can't even see them. And again, it's a place in the property that we only use during the daytime. Well, I mean, to be a little bit more clear on that, our use of the property, that's where we keep our trash cans. And, you know, we don't really spend any time there. You know, there was some discussion of... I'm sorry, this is Andy Ward, Debbie's husband. Some discussion of raising the fence or putting a lattice, and we wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that, but it's really not necessary. There is an existing fence there that we installed when we bought the house in 1999, and it's perfectly adequate. 
I don't really see a need for any additional fencing. Thank you. Do we have any other indication that anyone else would like to address the commission? If not, we will close the public hearing and bring it back for the commissioners. Anyone wish to comment or raise some questions? This is Commissioner Wilk. I'll take a couple of questions or comments. I tend to agree with the staff recommendation. The concern I have, though, is the precedent that we might be setting. And so as a result, I'd like to have it noted that there was a mistake on our part, on the city's part, the building inspector, that this is not something which we would normally approve, but that the notion of that was approved in error should somehow be in the record. If for no other reason than in the future people use this as a reference or precedent, that's in the record. Secondly, I also don't think there's a need for the planter or the fence addition for the reasons stated by the neighbor. Thank you. That's all. Anyone care to go next? I wish to occur with Commissioner Wilk. Okay. Commissioner Christensen or Welch? Commissioner Welch here. I agree. This is a little bit of a pet peeve with me, by the way, that this area reads where we really don't allow some, in some areas, for residents to use a full area of their property. This was a mistake on our part. Well, this isn't exactly the area I was talking about as far as allowing the full use of it. This is an area that's not going to have a structure on it as far as living space or anything. And I really want to thank the neighbors for supporting that. It's not something that is prevalent as you would like to see these days when you have people supporting you. So I think that's great. I'm looking for support of the various. Commissioner Christensen? Yeah, in short, I agree with both of what Peter and Commissioner Welch stated as well. I think that in addition to what Commissioner Wilk was saying, is that I'd like to have it noted that they consulted the neighbor, possibly, that in something so minor as this, I feel, in precedent, if this were ever to come up again, I think if it could happen the same way, it would seem appropriate that, you know, that this is the circumstances, this is how they consulted the neighbor, and then this is how they got it through. We will have the neighbor's letter in the record. Great. And also the testimony. So I have a few thoughts on this. One is, first, it is the state of affairs that when the city makes a mistake in approving plans, and that mistake is later discovered, even if it's completely built, that it's unfortunate for the applicant. And any city attorney and municipal lawyer will tell you that that is absolutely the state of the law, that you don't waive the ordinances because the city made a mistake in reviewing the plan. But I think the variance is a good solution to this. I just don't think that a lot being oversized is a special circumstance that justifies a variance. If it's too small, I don't understand how being too large can justify a variance. But I think those justify a variance is the mistake that the city made. And the financial impact of that. So the statute says special circumstances, including the shape, size, et cetera, of the lot, but it doesn't say that other things can't be a special circumstance. I think the findings should focus on the fact that, one, the city approved the plans in error, and, two, the purpose of the 
from the three-foot setback of safety, fire safety, and privacy do not in this situation require that the improvements be removed. So I think that would be a better basis for a better finding for the variance. Question, Commissioner Newman. So you talked about legal precedent. So it is, you being a lawyer, it is in your opinion that there would be no case for the applicant should we deny this to bring a lawsuit to recover the repair of the property against the city? Correct. Yes, of course, I speak as a planning commissioner, not as a lawyer. We have a city attorney when we have legal questions. But that is my, I mean, it's always been my understanding, and I've seen it in many, many circumstances throughout my career where counties or cities have made mistakes in approving plans, and later the applicant has been forced to, at sometimes significant expense, make changes because later inspectors found that it didn't comply with the ordinances. But, and that's really, it seems very unfair because you think if the city approves it, then it's their fault, but that's not the way it works. However, I think we have a way around it here that makes sense, which is a variance. So, I'd like to make a motion except that there are so many addendums to the staff approval, I'm not sure I can capture them all. I'd like to have the variance justification change. And I think you included the, also in your modification, the notion that we do acknowledge it was a city error. Absolutely, yes. So, would you want to maybe restate your... Yeah, the special circumstance that warrants a variance here is that the patio was installed with approval from the city of Capitola in error, and now that the error has been discovered, we determined that the purposes of the setback, which are fire safety and privacy, don't really require that given the city error that we force the applicant to remove the patio. So, does that take good notes about the special circumstances? Yes. So, I would move a staff recommendation on this item with the modification of the special circumstances as stated by Chairman Newman. Did you also want to exclude the planter and the fence improvement? Good call. Yes, I would also like to exclude the planter and fence as a requirement. Those weren't in there anyway, so that's fine. Okay, do we have a second to the motion? Please do a second. Commissioner Christensen? Yes. Okay, does everyone understand the motion? Okay, we don't need to read it back at this point, so roll call vote. Commissioner Root? Aye. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. And Chairman, aye, so that passes unanimously. Patio is done. That takes us to our next and final public hearing, which I know that all the commissioners have been excited to get back to the zoning code, but we are getting close to the end. And staff report on that, please? Yes. Okay, can you, there we go, and are you seeing two screens or just one on your, 
Are, are you seeing two screens or one? Two. Okay. One moment. Okay, now one? Yes. Great. Okay, good evening, Planning Commission. Um, first, I just want to clarify on that. Just one thing is that we did not charge that last applicant for the variance permit. So that question didn't come up, but I was, uh, I wanted to let you all know that that was a free review due to the error made by um, our internal staff. Tonight, I'm here for probably the 50th, no. <laughs> probably close to the 50th meeting on the zoning code update. And this may be our last zoning code update prior to submitting to the Coastal Commission. Um, w tonight also with us is Ben Noble of Ben Noble Planning who has been through this entire process with us and he's been here even longer with the uh, general plan update. So uh, Ben is on the call and will also be help, um, here to answer any questions. I'm quickly going to give you an overview of the process, then we're gonna talk about what the city council did more recently, and then there are two minor changes that, well, they're kind of big, they're, they're items that we felt like we could not take this for adoption without uh, having the planning commission review. Um, so we'll get there, and I'm sorry that didn't come out in the staff report, but it only came up later uh, after it was published. So here goes. As you know, uh, currently, See if I can get the, there we go. As you, right now we're um, operating with two zoning codes, one for inside the coastal zone and one outside. The uh, original adoption of our zoning code was in 2018. Since that time, we've been working with the Coastal Commission staff to bring the coast, our zoning code to a point that they would certify. Um, the process within the, to, to have a um, zoning code submitted for an LCP update requires that Planning Commission provide a recommendation to the City Council and then the City Council will adopt the document. In this, we went through this process in March of 2019 with the Planning Commission giving a, a positive recommendation to the City Council. Once we took it to City Council, um, there were quite a few, that, uh, with in regards to our coastal overlay zone, there was quite a few concerns about possible um, not not the standards not being in line with the um, with the law the state law for um, what the um, the function of the Coastal Commission is so we re re we've we spent a good amount of time on that and on July 21st after I think it was six City Council meetings reviewing the most recent changes, they asked, they um, recommended that staff publish the document for six weeks for public review. Return to Planning Commission is a requirement at this point because such substantial changes were made. So the Planning Commission will review tonight. If you need more time, we can hold a, a, a special meeting in two weeks. Um, if the Planning Commission moves forward tonight, the City Council will be looking at this. We'll give them an update next week on the 18th, and then two weeks following that will be the first reading. And um, then we'll be submitting for the LCP update to the Coastal Commission. And when you submit an LCP update to the Coastal Commission, it can either get reviewed by the Coastal Commission and approved and certified, Oftentimes, the Coastal Commission will make an approval contingent upon red lines that they put into your document. At that point, we can either accept all of their red lines and it'll be a certified document, or we cannot accept the red lines and propose revisions. And the third option is that we don't accept the red lines and decide no further action, and then we result with two codes, which we've been experiencing for the past two years and are hoping to move out of that stage. Um, so there were four larger items that went back before City Council. Um, the first was the discussion on Monarch Cove Inn. The Monarch Cove Inn is made up of three parcels. On the parcel one that you see has an office with a carport and one bedroom cottage. 
The second parcel in the middle, it's actually a piece of right of way, is a two bedroom cottage. And the third parcel has the 11 bedroom in. There's an existing standard on there for residential uses by the owner and their family members of up to three units per parcel. This is to have a single family home um, on three parcels as long as a minimum of six guest bedrooms are available for visitors use within three parcels. So there's this allowance for single family if as long as you keep having guests. So um, the owner of the Marnock Cove Inn has been uh, running this inn for a very long time and they're at a point in their lives that they'd like to retire. So they've been working with staff and trying to figure out a way to keep this property available to the public to enjoy without having to um, run a full an inn or six guest rooms. So to bring you back during the 2018 adoption, it was, allow, uh, it was updated to allow single family dwelling with a, um, as long as it meets the development standards of the R1 zone. We took this to the Coastal Commission staff. They added a note saying single family dwelling can be permitted as a CUP, but it's allowed only if ancillary to visitor accommodating, accommodation use. So only if it's secondary to accommodation use. The Planning Commission reviewed this and during uh, their recommendation, they said allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodation use or a grant of public access to a viewpoint. When this um, recommendation got to City Council, the City Council changed the land use table to add vacation rental as a conditional use for the site. And then under single family, it remains a conditional use and the note was modified to say allowed in conjunction with overnight accommodations use of at least one of the properties or a grant of public access to a viewpoint. So it's similar to where you landed, but just um, utilizing the terms in the zoning code for overnight accommodations. Um, also during the review by city council, the property owners provided a little uh, site plans of where the proposed viewpoint dedication could be. I want to make it clear that this is not set. If, if they were to move forward with a single family home, they would have to come in with an application to um, establish exactly where the proposed viewpoint would be. But just to give you an idea of what they were thinking, on the left of the slide, you can see the walk, the pathway that goes out along Marnock Cove. Here's a picture of the viewpoint as it is today. And then um, this was drawn up by a local artist of what they're thinking in terms of a dedication. So that's the update on the first topic. Um, I was thinking I would give you and go through all of the overviews and um, answer any questions at the end of my presentation. If anyone has any questions in between, feel free to um, let me know. But I was just going to go through these quick and then we can go to questions. So topic two was chapter 44, the coastal overlay zone. This, as I said, went through a really in-depth review by um, our staff and our legal staff to make sure there was no overreach that goes beyond what's allowed by the state law. Um, there are many changes. Um, within your packet, there was, um, there's a document of all the changes that occurred within chapter 44. And I have slides on this. I, we can go back to this if there's questions on that chapter. Um, topic three is village parking. Um, this is the section of code that we, um, as, as the Planning Commission has struggled with over the past couple of years as applications come in to the city for requesting parking within the village. And then there's some, the language is very unclear in the code now and um, this, the latest update is to clean up that language. So here you see a, an active city street um, and you can see there's very few curb cuts and it's very pedestrian friendly as, and f folks can walk along it and experience parades. And um, here we are in Capitola, again, another pedestrian friendly street, very few curb cuts. When we looked back at the language within the mixed use zoning district and the intent in our coastal land use plan, it's clear that the purpose of, uh, of the confusing language that 
was previously in our code is to protect those pedestrian walkways and not create more curb cuts um, and to allow development um, as long as the the parking is in the near vicinity so we've reworded this section of code we've also when it went to the city council um, they cleaned up uh, under B, the Planning Commission may permit off-site parking. Before it said for non-residential uses, but they struck that, so it's for non, for residential and, non and commercial if the spaces are within walking distance. And within this language, we also added, so it's extremely clear where you can and cannot do things, um, figure one, which shows exactly where the residential overlays are that are referenced in the section of code, what the commercial core is, um, and also identifies the mercantile and theater sites. So we can come back to that if you have questions. Topic four, the village hotel and height. Um, for the village hotel and height, the original uh, 2018 code, we got comments from the Coastal Commission requesting they fixed one of our v APN numbers. They also added um, standards for the maximum height, adding a standard of 10 feet below the top elevation, and also um, specified that that standard would include all rooftop architectural elements, such as chimneys, cupolas, et cetera, and all mechanical um, apertures, such as elevator shafts, HVAC units, et cetera. And then they also added where the, um, viewpoints are to, main, to make sure that um, when reviewing an application to make sure that, the, uh, uh, um, that there's still a green edge above the top of the hotel. And they suggested the Capitola Beach, Cliff Drive, and the Capitola Wharf. When this went to Planning Commission, uh, there were changes made to um, the viewpoints. And here, here you can see the Capitola Wharf viewpoint makes sense. The southern parking lot of Cliff Drive makes sense. We removed Capitola Beach because it's so much lower than the hotel. Um, so here's the Planning Commission recommendation, removing the 10 feet and the um, architectural features that would be on top of a roof, and then the clarification of what those viewpoints are. When this was reviewed by the City Council, they said let's, they agreed with the Planning Commission not to have the 10 feet but they said, let's keep in those architectural features that um, are typically found on a rooftop architectural features and make sure that they're under that height so they couldn't um, go above that visible green edge. And they also appreciated the revisions the Planning Commission made and the viewpoints and added existing mature trees shall be maintained on the site except that trees that are unhealthy or unsafe may be removed because there are quite a few, um, I think there was concern with some of the trees on the site and not requiring that the unhealthy ones be saved. Um, the next topic I'm going to hand over to Ben Noble of, of Ben Noble Planning. And Ben, I can run the slides for you. We can. Okay, so Katie asked me to walk through uh, the next two topics. These are two issues that came up as um, staff was uh, finalizing the zoning, zoning ordinance to move forward. One has to do with, um, uh, next slide please, drive through, standards for drive throughs So there's a um, current uh, requirement uh, in the CR zoning district where drive throughs are allowed with a conditional use permit that um, the drive through is prohibited within 100 feet of a residential zoning district or residential use, including residential properties outside of the city limits. Um, that's actually a footnote in the allowed use table. And uh, city staff um, has found that there's not a clear uh, uh, rule for measuring that 100 feet. Next slide, please. So 
uh, staff has prepared a uh, recommend, recommended rule of measurement for this standard, uh, and it's shown here on the, on the screen. So uh, the distance uh, with this recommendation would be measured from any site feature designed and or used for drive-through service, such as a vehicle aisle menu board or lighting, to the property line of the residential district or use. This um, rule of measurement seemed to make the most sense uh, given, given the intent of standard. Next slide, please. So the other issue that came up is rooftop decks. Next slide, please. And currently, uh, within the zoning code, there's a table that identifies all the different types of projects that require a design permit for single family, multi family, and non residential uses. Um, and uh, the rule currently for residential uses is that a design permit is required for upper floor decks and balconies on the side or rear of a home that are not adjacent to public open space. So a question came up recently as to whether or not a rooftop deck uh, requires uh, a design permit. Next slide, please. And so uh, staff thinks that this is something that um, should be clarified. Uh, we all sort of searched our memories to see if this was something that was discussed in the zoning code was previously reviewed by the Planning Commission um, and the City Council. We couldn't exactly recall if this had come up. Um, we do think that it is something that um, should be clarified. And if indeed the desire is to require a design permit for any rooftop deck, um, the uh, table in the zoning code about design permit requirements should be amended to say that. Next slide, please. So the way that we would handle that is to um, add the table 1721 um, within uh, chapter 1720 uh, to make it uh, explicitly clear that all rooftop decks uh, require a design permit, uh, both for single family uh, homes as well as multi-family projects. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Um, so, yes. Commissioner Wilk has a question. Go ahead, please. Um, the definition of a rooftop deck, does that mean the deck on the highest roof of a multi roof house home? Or if we have two roofs, right, one on the, on the second story or the third story or whatever, the rooftop deck only refer to the highest roof. Yeah, that's a good question. Katie, is this something that you thought about? You know, um, we do have standards for upper floor deck, so I think in the scenario that you're referencing, it sounds like there would be a portion of a home that you, or, or business that you could walk out onto an upper floor deck. It's actually part of that floor. And within our like single family for an upper floor deck and balcony on the side or rear of the home, that does require a design permit, and that's clear. So the rooftop deck would be the deck on the the very top of the home, the structure. Okay, so if that's clear. <clears throat> No more questions. Okay, that can. Have any questions? Okay. Uh, just, this commission, Jamal, well, just I was going to read some of the things I've seen the items on the talking right now with you about the things. I apologize. I yeah. couldn't. I could not hear that clearly. Your connection was uh, interrupted there, Commissioner Welch. Try again. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? There. Yes. Okay. Uh, are we talking about any questions with the uh, the coastal overlay, or just in items uh, regarding uh, the lot of items you can? So let's open it up to anything. Okay. <laughs> I, I just have actually I have a lot, but I'm looking at I won't go through every one. 
But as you know, I'm not a big fan of coastal commissions. Uh, I can overreach today. I think they impede into city uh, responsibilities and kind of take away some of our uh, areas of control. So um, first, I, I would say that the uh, purpose statement is it's much better written than it was initially as drafted by the Coastal Commission. But I have a couple of questions about um, some terminology and items they put in there. And, and some of these lead back to some of the very discussions we're having tonight, uh, like about modern code. So I, I think the city council addressed the issue with the viewpoint, and there's an area behind modern code that uh, appears to be in no man's land. The city's not sure who owns it, but modern code says they own it. That would allow a viewpoint of view shed, so I think that's great. But uh, under item on page 205, item G in the Coastal Resources, it talks about public use. And uh, I, I just have not been able to find that in the Coastal Act. Their policies talk about it, but it's not in the Coastal Act. And I don't know why you would start trying to put uh, view sheds into our code when currently we can allow view sheds. So that's just one question I have on how we go with that. Um, another one is uh, on page 206 and item O, shoreline protective, protective devices, which obviously is a funny concern for those people who live on the bluff. But it's, the last sentence says is something that I'm not sure what the definition is, but it says design as protection against coastal hazards for resulting in impacts to shoreline processes. So my question is, what what are the shoreline processes where is that? Uh, where do we find that? Is that in the glossary or it's not in the book that I can find in the glossary? So I'd be concerned about what they consider also is that waves crashing against the bluff? Is this bluff or erosion? Is that just part of the process and they're saying that we can't prevent that? Which I would hate to tie our hands in that area. So that's another question I have. I'm not a fan of their legal development permitting process, but that is what it is. Another one is on page 210. Uh, and I made one. It talks, it talked about uh, the environmentally sensitive ha habitat area, which I understand. It also says in areas designated as highly scenic in our LCP. I don't recall a highly scenic area. I remember seeing view shifts, but uh, do we have a highly scenic area and what is that and where are those areas that uh, would be a concern of mine. Um, and then we get into the Coastal Commission's, um, I think, pushing their way in by policy talking about how we do improvements in our property, so to speak, with our code. Our code. And it's talked about, um, this is item 4, 84 on, uh, let's see, uh, this is a uh, 1744.080A4, and it talks about additional improvements of 10% or less for improvement to the structure as previously been undertaken pursuant to the section. And when it comes to permitting, I think it would be nice to keep it as a minimum to have a coastal design permits. And we have control of that, and I, I see, Kate, that you have some areas where we do have some control in that area, but. Um, well, runs along, well, anywhere along the, uh, the coastal area, but especially in the flood area, require uh, quite a bit of maintenance. Just, uh, I have a neighbor who has replaced their wooden windows three times in the last 20 years or so that they've owned their house. That alone could reach the 10%. Uh, those windows are not cheap, so I have a concern about that. And staying on the page 11, you know, get involved in increase the existing structure of 10% to go through that. And I, I, for me, I just think it's overreach for them. They can come down to the ocean, and, uh, and that's what we worry about um, when we do our development in our homes. Those are just, I mean, I could go on and on here, but the boots are just so I'm really nervous about murder, and uh, can I take a response to that type of I was working again and maybe seeing binoculars to begin with, but here we are talking about a private piece of property on uh, Monaco 
and we're arguing about uh, private property having a public use in it, which to me is just absolutely ridiculous. And thankfully, I think we can have a, uh, at least some common ground with that piece of property behind product code. But I would hope the city would never support the Coastal Mission pushing a private property owner to have public access to the property. So those are, those are my concerns. I want to see that those and how it even made sense to me. But, Thank you. The question is uh, for us then, I guess, if you you have raised um, quite a number and maybe have more issues with the Coastal Commission changes, so do you want to uh, continue to pursue this and maybe set another hearing and go through them one by one and make recommendations uh, at this point, or are you just making comments and uh, okay with it moving forward? Well, I would, if there was support from the Planning Commission to maybe do a little more wordsmithing so we better understand what we're agreeing to, then that would be great. If not, then I guess, um, I mean, it's an individual, I'm not gonna hold this up. I, we've been involved with this COSA for a zoning code for a number of years now. Well, not that I felt we were knowing Tim Noble and what yeah. he does. And so, well, I know your, your sentiments regarding... I'll leave it up to the rest of you. Just to what happened. Your sentiments regarding the Coastal Commission, I mean, you, you made clear in other circumstances. The, the, the concern I have is that, that there's so many different um, parties involved in this process that it's hard to see how it can come to an end. And we have this, the Planning Commission, our legislative body is really the City Council. And so they, a lot of these things the City Council has weighed in on. And then the Coastal Commission has negotiated with our staff to try and work through some of the issues. And now it's back to the Planning Commission and with all these different parties um, and not everyone getting together for a constitutional convention like happened in 1790. My concern is whether we would ever get to an end. Well, I don't understand. Uh, you know, this is one of the things that I, I really try to balance. I, uh, we represent uh, the residents of Capitola and what they're going to have to deal with for the next one. And then we're going to spend 10, 10, 15, 20 years since we've done the last one for peace. And uh, we've been stuck with it, so I'm not. I'm not going to beat this. I would ask maybe with a couple of these that we just have a better understanding of what those terms mean, uh, and maybe it's a single glossary so that when it comes time, I can see there's going to be a, a point where we start losing homes along the bluff, and there's going to have to be a discussion about do we um, or do residents have. Uh, um, the ability to protect their structures. And, and the Coastal Act is very clear on this, that private property owners have, have rights. Um, it, the policy will seem to support that. But I think this is the time. I don't, I don't know, we just had another bluff of, um, collapse this last week. Um, so who knows how quick it's gonna happen, but it's not gonna be long before it's in the some of our neighbors' homes. It may not be your home, it may not be my home, but they're residents of Capitola, and I think we have a responsibility to, to look out for that, and this is the time to do it. It's either now or, you know, I don't think we're going to be writing a new LCP in the next four or five years, so those are my concerns, is that we, we give our residents um, some tools to work with when it comes time to protect their homes. But that, I must add, I'll keep. What are the other commissioners' uh, thoughts about how we should proceed? Well, yes, yeah, Commissioner Wilk. Uh, Commissioner Wilk. Um, so, uh, my uh, approach is we, we had our shot with the plan with the Coastal Commission. We had them in, we talked to them, we negotiated with them, we forwarded our comments to the City Council. They struggled with it, they appreciated our efforts and then modified it. And to me, this is more of a rubber stamp meeting where we had our shot, we put our input, and as you said, the city council is the governing 
body. So we advise them, we have done that, and so as a formality, it has to come back to us. So to me, it's, it's a formality, and we should, we should get on with it and, and approve it. Commissioner Ruth or Christensen, any thoughts? Yeah, I just, I, I think Commissioner Welch raises some valid points, but again, I, I tend to agree with, with Commissioner Wilkes. Uh, I think we've discussed these issues in the past, but I think if, if individual commissioners have issues at this point, I think they should submit those as an individual commissioner to the city council for their final determination. That's a good suggestion. And Commissioner Christensen? I, I agree with um, Commissioner Ruth. Um, I, 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 mean, I agree with everything uh, Commissioner uh, Welch is saying, but I just, I, I feel like the council will acknowledge um, if, 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 we, if we offer input at this point. Um, Okay, no, nobody's mentioned the two uh, wording changes that were recommended that don't have to do with the Coastal Commission. I assume that means that everybody's okay with those proposed changes. Um, there's a lot of, I don't agree with everything that's in this new code yet that's been um, changed as it's gone along. I, I, don't, I don't really agree with the final results of the uh, hotel site, but and there comes a time where it's it's a good code. It's a lot better than what we had, and it's we've been going at it. This one was actually first part of the general plan process that ended in 1984, but then we decoupled the the zoning code, and it's been going on for six years since then. So it comes a time where we have to kind of like just move on. And it's certainly a all in all. A good effort, and there are some issues like Commissioner Welch has pointed out that uh, might not be ideal. And we can fight with the Coastal Commission for a long time, but I don't really think that's that's a good way to go. And that's really the City Council's job anyway. So, do we need to do this on Katie by motion, or is it just uh, consensus, or what would you like? a motion, please? Motion, please. Oh, this is a public hearing, by the way. So, um, if anyone in the public had uh, and wanted to speak, I assume by now they would have either put up their hand or emailed us or phoned in. And have we heard from anybody? Let me see. I haven't received any email. Okay. So, we'll close the public hearing and uh, do we have a motion? So what are we moving? Are we moving approval of the zoning code as applied with the proposed changes that staff has presented? I I uh, I so move. Second. Okay. Any further questions or comments? So we will roll call. Uh, Commissioner Christensen. I just have a quick comment in between there. Sure. Let me just say that our uh, city staff. And our attorneys have done a great job trying to get this done. And I understand that this fight could go on for a long time. But um, I just want to make that clear before I cast my vote because uh, I think the agency has done a great, a great job in this. And Ben, too. Yeah, we don't want to leave you out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ben is staff. Yeah, I'm going to Okay, um, so back to the voting. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Commissioner Welch? No. And uh, I vote aye, so that passes four to one. And uh, moves on to the, I guess, the city council. And that, again, anyone who wants to comment this, uh, individually with the city council can, of course, do that. So the next item is the director's report. Okay. Um, 
I have a couple items for you this evening. Uh, first, an exciting opportunity exists now for small businesses. Um, there's a new grant opportunity through the, um, through the County of Santa Cruz. The County of Santa Cruz, this is open until October 11th, has opened up a grant opportunity for any small business impacted by COVID-19. The county received close to three quarters of a million dollars um, that is available to small businesses that are located within the county or any of the four incorporated cities, including Capitola, uh, to aid in maintaining their business and workforce. The grants are for 15, 000, up to $15,000 and will be awarded to provide immediate financial support to businesses. Small business is defined un under this grant as a business having fewer than 25 people. Um, grant funds may be used to reimburse payroll expenses due to business interruption, lease payments for business premises, um, and, and all, all the specifics of this are listed on our website on the front page. But applications are due no later than October 11th, and also on our website is the link to um, www.sccvitality.org. And I just want to show again on our front page of our website under what's new, it's the top item and it's under our capital of business recovery information. And secondly, I wanted to give you another update on our free temporary outdoor permits. Um, currently we're issuing free temporary outdoor use agreements that allows businesses to move outdoors to maintain social distancing. We typically turn these around within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we've had 22 issued and they've gone out to restaurants, bars, tasting rooms, hair salons, and massage. These will be continued on a monthly basis until social distancing requirements are no longer in place. So a couple, um, I just wanted to get that grant information out as well as uh, just an update on the temporary use agreements. and. Lastly, um, and, and we did get that information out to the BIA and the Chamber, so that information is being hopefully circulated to all the small businesses in Capitola. Um, and lastly, the City Council reviewed the inclusionary housing ordinance. They gave some policy. They had a policy discussion on August 27th. The, um, the Council is, they were open to looking at new um, alternatives other than just the 15% um, of required on-site affordable housing during a development. So um, looking at allowing an increase in lieu rather than providing the housing on-site, also um, alternatives of dedicating property which could be utilized for affordable housing. Sometimes there's great grant opportunities out there, but because we don't have any sites available for affordable housing, we can't take advantage of those grants that are available from the state and federal government. So um, the first reading for the draft, it'll be published tomorrow. Uh, there are still some items in there that we need to get clarity from the city council. So once we have the direction on this and exactly where they land, I'll be bringing a full update on the IHO to the Planning Commission. And my last update for you, which I mentioned during staff communication, is that the Coastal Commission um, certified our LCP amendments to secondary dwelling units and signs. We haven't had a rush of sign applications, but we have been busy with um, secondary dwelling applications. So. Um, that's the latest update. I'm not sure if Matt or Sean could tell you how many have come in in the past couple weeks since it's been allowed. Question? Yes. Um, you mentioned the outdoor seating uh, permit and Commissioner uh, Newman mentioned the uh, walkway in, in front of the Mexican restaurant or behind the Mexican restaurant next, next to Zelda's. Uh, did you approve or would you approve external seating in that area? Would there be a conflict? There would be a conflict. That's, um, that's, that area is identified within our, our um, land use plan, our coastal land use plan as an access point. So they're not allowed to, um, they, they have to keep that area open. On the 
back portion behind the restaurant, there is some area in which we've allowed them to have outdoor seating. Six seats to be exact, but that face out to the Zelda's deck. They have a permit for that. But along that covered portion in between the two buildings, that would not be allowed. Okay. Okay. And that concludes my update. Thank you. So last item on the agenda is the commission communications. Anyone? Congratulations to Ace fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the sports season is picking up. Okay, so the next planning commission meeting will be in five weeks. I think it's after the election. So We'll have some new council people at that point in time, maybe. And uh, we'll see you then. The meeting is adjourned. Good night. Good night. Good night.